So, well, uh, for everybody who's tuning in today, it's another episode of Twisted Pair, and uh, we're doing something a little different. We decided we were going to, uh, as part of the Twisted Pair kind of universe, bring you people that we talk to, deal with, count on, and call friends in the industry. And today, the first one we're bringing you is Pete Kingwell. And Pete, will you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Pete Kingwell. I'm the owner of Headed Media Group, and we're the company that uh, produces Police Fleet Manager Magazine. And additionally, we produce the Police Fleet Expo, the annual conference that is for police fleet managers all across North America. Sweet. And how long has Police Fleet Expo been going on? So we're going into our 17th year of Police Fleet Expo coming up. Um, it was started, believe it or not, by um, uh, input from a former employee of ours and a, I guess, recently retired employee of Sound Off Signal, a gentleman named Phil Von Tom, who many people out there know Phil. Um, at the time, Phil was working for us in our offices in Chicago, and he um, came to us with an idea, and he said, you know, guys, uh, we have Police Fleet Manager Magazine. We should take a look at doing Police Fleet Expo. There's a, a kind of a void in the industry for something like this that is very fleet specific. Um, at the time, you know, tactical events around the country were very popular, um, and even technology events were very popular that were very specific. Um, but there was nothing at the time for fleet management level personnel. And uh, we thought, gosh, that's a really good idea. And uh, so the idea was born. And oddly enough, the very first Police Fleet Expo took place not too far away from the Sound Off headquarters. And uh, the, the first show was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, way back when. Wow. That's cool. It's funny when when I first hired on at Sound Off, I was walking through one of the hallways and I looked over on a coat rack and there was this leather bomber jacket hanging with this like legit Police Fleet Expo logo on it. And it was it turns out it was Phil's and he had it hung up there and it was uh, one like the first or second year show jacket uh, from what I understand. That's true. We did do some leather jackets that first year. Um, we've had other um, swag throughout the years. The leather jacket, oddly enough, turned out to be not as popular as we would have hoped because of the timing of the show uh, in August. It is very uncomfortable to wear a heavy leather jacket when you're in destinations like Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, you know Richmond, Virginia, Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, there's not much call for a heavy leather winter jacket, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, Grand Rapids in August makes a whole lot more sense, it seems like. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, so, uh, I think you're here to kind of tell us about this year's show. And um, a lot of the listeners probably or watchers know that last year's show was canceled due to the uh, current... Uh, pandemic situation and this year we're back on is that correct that is correct so in fact we just got off the phone yesterday um with governor northam's office and the uh greater richmond convention bureau um we were on a, on a conference call with them and uh they indicated to us uh the convention bureau in richmond virginia where the show is going to be held this year um, indicated, uh, let the governor's office know of all the different events they have coming up this summer. And the governor's office indicated that there should be no problems having hosting any events. Um, events, in fact, in Richmond right now are at 30% capacity or 500 people, whichever is greater. Um, so they're already hosting events in Richmond, Virginia. And by the time we arrive in August, um, it should be wide open. We we anticipate that the convention center will be, um, you know, fully open. And if those who attend want to wear a mask, they are certainly welcome to do so, but it will not be required. We are suggesting, however, that attendees coming to the show um, bring a mask because there are public spaces that may not be able to uh, accommodate people without masks. There may be certain private businesses and public venues such as museums um, and sporting events and so forth that may still require mask wearing. So uh, we do recommend you bring the mask, 
but at most of the PFE, if not all PFE events, will be uh, maskless. So we're we're very excited. We we very much missed having everybody last year, but we're at the same location this year, um, and we're excited to see all of our old friends again. Awesome. It's always a good time. It every, is always a good every time. year. So, and and furthermore, um, to give you guys a little bit more on on exactly what we have coming up this year, um, right now we have over a hundred fleet specific vendors signed up, and we're getting new vendors signed up every day. Um, we're going to have some really big surprises this year, as far as some new vendors that are coming to the show. Um, one that I can officially announce today is uh, Mahindra. Mahindra manufactures a vehicle called a Roxor. It's a brand new vehicle from Mahindra Automotive. Um, they're an Asian company um, and they've put out a very low cost, um, almost Jeep looking type utility vehicle um, that they're going to be bringing to the show. And of course it will be available to drive at our ride and drive and, and be able to jump in it and test it out. Uh, at the track, as well as seeing it on the show floor. So we're excited that, you know, lots of other companies are taking a look at the police market and trying to offer, uh, you know, new products, new offerings, um, and trying to get more specific for specific needs of the police uh, market. Uh, last, uh, not last year, but two years ago, we had uh, Polaris come, and it looks very likely that they'll come back with their line of uh, vehicles, utility vehicles and off-road vehicles again. And like I said, we can't make any more official announcements, but keep an eye on our uh, website because there are many more vehicle companies that we are currently in discussion with um, that, that are going to be coming and it's going to be super exciting to see them and see what, uh, we see what completely new offerings are going to be available to police departments. So it's exciting stuff. Awesome. Um, what, what's the, the ride and drive looking like for this year? So the ride and drive, and, and thank you for asking, we're, that might be what I am most excited about coming up for uh, this PFE. We are um, hosting, co-hosting, I guess, with uh, the Virginia State Police out of their track facility in Blackstone, Virginia. And when I say it's amazing, it is truly nothing short of amazing. Um, there is, uh, there's going to be images and track designs and everything available on our website soon. Um, we're just finalizing some of the, some of the layouts and so forth, but the Virginia state police track is a very long track. It's over a two mile track. Um, it has both on-road and off-road capabilities. So both of those again will be available for all of our attendees, but new brand new this year is the Virginia state police also have what they call an urban track which is a small scale city that has things like stoplights and pedestrian crossings um, and that type of stuff. And we're going to be utilizing that track as well for um, things like utility vehicles, motorcycles, and of course uh, the personal transportation vehicles, things like segways and that type of thing um, to let officers and, and fleet managers get a chance to actually get on these things and give them a, give them a shot. So we're really excited about it. Um, you know, it, it's the largest track facility that we've ever had, and it's the most complete and, and designed completely with police in mind. Um, so we're, we're, we're extremely excited about that. That's cool. great. Uh, I know we've had some really good tracks in the past venues. Uh, Savannah in 2019 kind of stands out as probably my favorite. Uh, and then the, uh, I think, 2016 in Columbus, uh, that was a really nice facility as well. But I got to tell you, I visited last year um, in anticipation of PFE 2020. I did a site visit to the VSB track, and it is, as you you had advised, I mean, it's just impressive. Uh, I've, they've got freeway on ramps and off ramps and all kinds of stuff. And I think the attendees are really going to enjoy it. And and that idea of using the vehicles in a, in a more realistic setting, I think, is going to appeal to a lot of folks. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the whole thing is about putting, you know, being able to test drive the vehicle in a real world environment, right? So in the past, we've held track events at places like um, Gateway Motor Speedway and Charlotte Motor Speedway, and those are great and they're fun. But the fact of the matter is they're not real to life. Driving an oval or driving um, a pseudo road course 
isn't exactly what a police officer or a police department would encounter on a daily basis. Um, and that's why you, the track, like you mentioned, Matt, the Columbus track, where, where that was their, their official um, police track for the Ohio uh, Peace Officer Training Academy, and then now the Virginia State Police one. They're designed specifically with our needs in mind and training with the needs of police departments. They're not, they were never designed to be race tracks. They were always designed to be training facilities. So um, yeah, it gives, a, it just gives a great opportunity to test a car or any other vehicle in a real world environment. And that's the goal is to learn about the car and drive it in a way that you would normally drive it. So um, electric vehicles are starting to become the big craze and just in the world. Thoughts on that or anything new for that coming up? So we cannot make any official announcements <laughs> on, the, on any electric vehicles, but I would say <laughs> but I would say that um, there will be some surprises of companies going to uh, be visiting us at the show. But uh, without uh, we can't tip our hat quite yet. Uh, until we have an official announcement. But like I said before, keep an eye on our website because there uh, should be some in some very interesting information coming soon. So Nice. Yeah. Awesome. And of course, you know, even our standard manufacturers, many of them are already moving, you know, with new and electric um, ideas in mind. I mean, everybody's seen the news with the Ford F-150s coming out with an electric vehicle. Um, Ford already offers hybrid vehicles, I think, across their product line, as does GM and others. And if all you have to do is look into some of the automotive trade publications and, and news shows that, you know, every car company in America is pursuing some sort of uh, electric initiative, whether that be a hybrid model or uh, a fully electric. I mean, they're all going after that. And, and quite frankly, you know, for departments that are um, county and, and certainly municipal agencies, electric is a very attractive option right now. Um, you know, if you can recharge the car rapidly and you don't have to stray too far from the station, that's an attractive option. It may not be ready for prime time for things like highway patrol, uh, considering the long distances and, and, you know, the amount of time they spend behind the wheel. But that will come down the road, I'm sure, as battery technology improves and so forth. So, nice. Yeah, um, I I think it is pretty evident that 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 change is going to be a change that police departments are going to have to embrace uh, probably sooner than they're anticipating, and for all kinds of reasons. Um, certainly, energy efficiency and and wanting to help contribute to reducing uh, the carbon footprint. But also, it, it makes a lot of sense to get away from from the traditional type of fuels for so many departments, and so, and that reminds me kind of, and and I want to hear your thoughts. Um, how much have you seen the industry change since the Crown Vic went away? How how big a deal do you think that was? Well, it's a it's a it's a complete change. Uh, you're seeing now that the you know the sedan usage. Uh, in general, has just decreased uh, tremendously with only, I believe at this point, there's only one official offering of a sedan, uh, which is the Dodge Charger. It's a terrific vehicle, terrific for highway patrol and those type of situations, but a lot of police departments are, you know, taking a look at the Tahoe, the Explorer, the Durango, and of course, uh, even the pickup trucks are getting a lot of traction these days um, as the mission of police departments change. And and, you know, the other thing that I think people forget sometimes is the amount of gear that a, an officer now needs to carry in the vehicle. They need to be prepared uh, for a plethora of different situations. Um, you know, everything from uh, emergency management, rescue, um, active shooter situations. You know, a lot of police departments are the first guys on the scene. And before they can activate and deploy a SWAT team, usually the patrol officer is on site for a substantial amount of time, um, requiring things like a long gun and um, beefed up armor and things of those, you know, things of that nature. So um, the vehicles themselves have had to sort of evolve along with that. 
Um, I was even reading an article recently how often uh, police agencies are now having to do medical transports, in particular in rural areas. Uh, you know, the police department is the first one on the scene. Somebody's in urgent need of medical care and, you know, potentially the ambulance is 20 to 25 minutes out and the person's not going to last 20 to 25 minutes. And therefore, the car has now become an ambulance. Um, so the need for greater space, greater flexibility, and more equipment storage has really just lent itself to these larger vehicles. Um, and I think it's a trend that is unlikely to change in the near future. That's Yeah, I, I think it is everything you said. The difference now between the Crown Vic Focus fleet versus the more diversified fleet, the fleets are just more capable. Um, everything that Crown Vic was, it was a great car. But today's vehicles are so much more versatile, so much more flexible, and uh, definitely help officers perform their mission better every day. Yeah, and it's an officer safety issue too, right? I mean, at the end of the day, all of us are here to, to see to it that um, every officer in, in North America starts and finishes their shift on the job. Um, that's what we're all trying to do. The car companies are trying to make those cars safer. Um, vehicle lighting companies like SoundOff are trying to make the cars safer so that the officers can go home at the end of their shift um, to their families, just like every other working class person in the country. Um, and, and, you know, the bigger cars, um, you know, they have safety features and just sheer size is, is, is a step in that direction. And, uh, you know, with the with the efforts of everybody, though, I think we've, you know, police officer accidents and deaths um, as far as vehicle related deaths are certainly on a downward trend. And everybody would like to keep it that way. So so speaking of like, the, you know, thefts and, and break in and we've got a lot of civil disturbances, you know, just in the last year alone. How important do you think uh, hardening to the vehicles, you know, body of the vehicle is uh just to the industry? So it, it, that's an intriguing question because the problem is it's difficult to predict where some of these incidents will occur. Uh, some are very easy. If you look at places that are notorious hotspots, places like Washington, D.C., Portland, Oregon, New York, um, they already know that they have to harden their vehicles. They need to install vehicle armor, um, bulletproof glass in some instances, and, uh, you know, overall hardening of the target, like you mentioned, Damon. But there's also instances where it becomes as a surprise. Um, close to where I live, Kenosha, Wisconsin, had an incident um, where, you know, there was civil disturbance and a lot of cars ended up getting damaged. Police officers got hurt. Um, and But they were not prepared. They weren't necessarily prepared for the type of situation that developed. Uh, both the Kenosha County PD and Kenosha County Sheriff's Office are fine agencies, but their vehicles weren't set up to handle that type of disturbance. You also have large events um, that take place, uh, like the motorcycle rally in Sturgis, South Dakota, and other of types of events like that, where they can go from friendly and accommodating to dangerous uh, relatively rapidly. And, uh, you know, police departments need that flexibility to, you know, harden the target of the car, protect the officer and protect the vehicle um, and, and, and see to it that, again, everybody gets home safely. Yep. Yeah, I think revisiting what you said about with the SUVs, they're carrying so much more gear just um, as a force multiplier, as, as, as the mission of the departments evolve and to be prepared. And and I think departments have kind of just considered uh, that stuff being under lock and key to be enough. But as we saw, sometimes you have to abandon that vehicle um, and, and leave it. And then all that gear is is definitely exposed. And I think departments are probably wising up to the fact that they really probably do need that window bar set in the rear windows in the cargo area. Somewhere they, they've always been focused kind of on keeping the prisoner from getting out. But I don't think they've thought about a bad guy trying to get into the vehicle nearly as much. So I, I would see that changing now. You know, it's interesting you brought that up. I was actually in a phone conversation the other day with a German manufacturer that is taking a look at the U.S. police market. And while on the phone, we kind of came up with the uh, unusual scenario because it's I've been in the market for 30 years and in the vehicle market. 
Um, the focus until recently has always been from uh, worrying from the inside out. In other words, not letting the prisoner escape, uh, keeping the prisoner um, locked down, tightened up with the belt and so forth. And really, that is evolving from it going to outside in, that yep. external factors are now becoming more important than the inside out factor. Um, and, you know, there are companies out there, military, uh, typically military manufacturers are actually starting to take a look at this market and say, hey, what can we do um, to modify our equipment to make police departments and police vehicles more secure? Um, and these are companies that are typically much more well known for, you know, up armoring Black Hawk helicopters and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and those type of things. But they are starting to take an interest. Uh, there's a lot of private industry that's looking at this market saying, hey, we should be able to step in here and help these help these agencies, you know, complete their mission and, and get everybody home safely. Yeah, I, I think that all that is going to be really, really important. Again, I, I think agencies are experiencing a lot of external factors, uh, influences that are going to change once again how they view their police vehicle, both as a resource and as an asset to protect. Absolutely. Uh, you know, for many years now, we've all looked at it and called the police vehicle the home office. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the police officer's driving around in his home office and so forth. But uh, And that is still true, no question about it. But we need to see to it that, uh, you know, the home office is also a protected environment for the officer. You know, there's a lot of distractions these days in a police vehicle. There's the computer, um, you know, typically there's a cell phone. Uh, depending on departmental policy, of course, um, and just other external factors that are distractions in the vehicle. So it's easy to lose focus and it's easy to lose perspective when you're in a car. And, you know, therefore, it, you know, the, the step up needs to be made to protect the vehicle more. I'm thinking back to when the Crown Vic offered for a year or two the the Halon fire extinguisher system installed in the vehicle from the factory. And, and I mean, this just popped in my brain, but I like remember that. And, and it really wasn't a very popular thing, but I could almost see a resurgence in that. Sure. Uh, you know, I think every new technology needs to be on the table and the things that, you know, truthfully two years ago, 18 months ago, we would never have thought of things like uh, the Ford Explorer being able to heat up to 167 degrees to kill uh, COVID-19 or other, you know, pathogens potentially that could be in the vehicle. Um, or bake my brownies. Or <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or make a very, make, make a very lovely breakfast for everyone. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> of course, the seat warmers have been available all along, Matt. So. <laughs> oh man, that's not what my purchasing department told me. <laughs> Can never get those approved. <laughs> but sure, I mean, there's a whole plethora of other things out there these days that, uh, you know, I, Matt, you've been around the business long enough to know that, you know, there used to be and still are to some extent woven wire partitions between the officer and, and sometimes the transport. But a lot of them have gone to a more fixed plexiglass situation um, just because of, you know, disease and, and other types of uh, bloodborne pathogens that may be present. Uh, you know, that's, that's all part of the package to protect the officer and protect the officer's family. So we've talked about the track. Uh, we've talked about some maybe some, some announced and potential new vendors that are going to be pretty exciting. Um, what about the educational sessions? As you know, uh, the few years there I served as the chair, I, I helped coordinate the educational sessions and, and often would, would uh, actually instruct at an educational session. And I really love that part of PFE the most. Honestly, all the, the new lights and the new cars are fun, but I always went there hoping to come back with more knowledge. So uh, in, in that vein, what, what do you have going on this year for educational sessions for those who are going to attend? So um, you're right, and we have an expanded. Um, we expanded our our educational offering from two tracks to four tracks when we went to Savannah, and that is something that we're going to keep with um, this year, and we're going to be offering even more education. Um, but in general, the two the, there's four main tracks. Um, the first one is for the beginning fleet manager, um, Matt, and and 
Damon, you guys have been to enough shows to see. Uh, on the first day, we usually ask how many people at the show are first-time attendees, and you see a fair amount of hands going up. Um, so we felt it's really important to keep those base level classes for the brand new fleet manager because many of the people coming to the show are new um, and they need those basic level understanding courses. Uh, you you got to walk before you run. So that's uh, those classes will be offered again, um, featuring guys that we, we all know and love people like TJ Tennant, who does the <laughs> tire forensics nice. program. Um, you know, that's a, a beginning fleet manager's uh, uh, go-to course for learning about driving and learning about tires. Uh, there's probably no better person in the world talking about police tires. Uh, from there, we move to sort of advanced fleet management, which is going to tackle some of the bigger topics, um, things like life cycle costing. Um, this year, we're going to be addressing things like Damon brought up earlier, addressing things like transitioning to EVs. Um, and how that looks and how that's going to work for police departments. Um, we also have a track on upfitting, which I know, Matt, is near and dear to your heart. And uh, so we'll be having a bunch of classes on, on vehicle upfitting. And then finally, vehicle technology, um, where we're going to discuss, you know, all the, all the items that are now going into the police vehicles, everything from ALPR um, to, you know, new and different types of mounts, built-in screens, things of that nature. Um it's funny, but these cars are becoming rolling computers and uh, rolling servers, and and uh, even even in some instances, part of a, a part of a, a vast mesh network out there of police vehicles. Considering all the new technologies coming out related to five G uh, and all the new capabilities that officers will be able to take advantage of with the new five G uh, capabilities that are rolling out in a lot of major cities right now. So. Um, and then finally, in addition to that, we're also going to be running some demonstrations and some classes out at the track. Everybody knows there is uh, sometimes there's a little bit of waiting periods in order to get into the vehicles that you want to drive. Um, of course, we'll have a lot more vehicles out there to drive this year, but we're also going to have a few demonstrations going on at the track to allow um, people to see, um, you know, things being installed into the vehicle or just learning very quick hit learning sessions, 15 minutes a piece. Um, just learning one or two small skills that may make a big difference. You know, the hardest part about all the classes is picking which ones you're going to go to. Because there's yeah. so <laughs> many of them. I remember in 2019, Matt and I were like, all right, divide and conquer. You tell me about what you saw and I'll tell you what I saw. Well, I appreciate you saying that. That means that we're picking the right topics, which is terrific. Um, and one of the things we are going to be working on this year is recording all of our sessions and making them available to everybody nice. after the show. Um, we are not allowed to record the sessions that are hosted by the big by the vehicle manufacturers, um, but the classroom sessions that we have um, will be recorded this year and will be made available to all of our attendees after the show. So. To your point, Damon, you no longer have to pick and choose which classes nice. you attend. You That's will be great. able to see them all um, post-show. So the big three are back with their annual update. They are, in fact, back with their annual update. Um, so we will be getting updates from, from Ford, uh, from Stellantis, formerly FCA, and uh, General Motors. So they are all back, and uh, we've got participation, again, from Zero Motorcycle, BMW Motorcycle, uh, Harley-Davidson, and very likely a couple of new players in that space. So keep your eyes out for that as well. Killing me. <laughs> <laughs> if you were at the Michigan State Police Trials, you could probably guess who might be some of the other companies coming. So no, we, I'm sure everybody can do that math on their own. And if not, they just need to come and see. That's right. That's right. Yep. Yeah. It's going to be a terrific event. Um, we've had uh, 20 months to plan it. Right. So, you know, uh, unwillingly 20 months to plan it, but 20 months to plan it nonetheless. So um, we've, you know, we're, we're thrilled to death to be back and, and, and just thrilled to death to be uh uh, seeing all of our old friends again. It's it's just terrific to watch all the people signing up for the show and all the companies that are going to be back. And, um, you know, our, our numbers for the show are trending uh, in an upward direction, as you might imagine. Um, everybody's excited to get back together and start talking about nice. anything else but COVID-19, I think. So... <laughs>
So, uh, Pete, tell us about the special guest this year. I heard heard YouTube. So we do have somewhat of a YouTube celebrity coming uh, again to our show. He was there in Savannah um, and is coming again to our show in Richmond. Um, it's uh, Nick Perez, um, known online as Nick Off Duty. Um, and he's a very popular um, YouTuber. And he also recently began his own podcast. Um, and he is going to be joining us again for the show. When he joined us in um, 2019 in Savannah, I was surprised to see after the show, he released two different videos about his experiences at PFE. One of them was just uh, him uh, participating in the track event. Um, which had a lot of really funny moments and a lot of great information. Um, and that one received, I think, over 140,000 views on wow. on YouTube. Um, and then he did another video um, from the show Floor, which, again, was Nick's sort of humorous take on, on some of the equipment and so forth that's available uh, on the show Floor. And it was interesting um, that that one has over 450,000 views on YouTube at this point. And to be honest with you, I would have figured that the track would have had more views than the show floor, but I have been proven wrong. Uh, but anyway, both of them were very, very popular, and uh, we're very excited to have Nick come back. He's a he's a great friend to the show, um, and he's a just a really he he he's, takes it seriously uh, as he is a Miami police officer, um, but he has a very humorous spin to most uh, nice. most of his interactions on the show floor. So and we're thrilled to have him back. That's I'm exciting. excited to see how he hits it the second time because I got the sense on the first couple of videos and then talking with him briefly that he's almost didn't know what he was getting into. Like it was almost overwhelming. There was a lot more content than maybe he counted on. I think that's probably fair to say. Yeah, he got there and uh, we were having some talks off camera and he was just, you know, just laughing and saying, I'm like a kid in a candy store. This is nice. like the greatest. There's so much content here. <laughs> I'm having a hard time figuring out what exactly I want to cover, uh, which is which is great. You know, we always want um, want to want to provide more. Um, so, you know, just not only to YouTubers, but to everybody who comes to the show, we want them to have a full plate, um, starting from, you know, starting from exhibits and track and all that stuff. And, and again, to the, even to the evening events that, uh, sound off is a terrific sponsor of, um, those, those networking events, in my opinion, are often as important as the educational sessions at the show. Um, being able to meet and talk with peers and getting to know guys, um, at other departments who may have similar size fleets or similar problems is invaluable to, uh, to fleet managers across the country. So, um, the evening events, you know, honestly are, are equally as important to all the other activities at the show. Well, awesome. I'm super excited to be back. I can't wait to, uh, get back to Richmond this time for real, uh, the venue visit last year was kind of a tease that, you know, than to have the show necessarily postponed. Um, but I think you're right. I think this year is going to be bang up at attendance as everybody tries to stretch their legs. I think you've picked a great location that's very central to all the major cities on the East Coast. And of course, uh, I expect you're going to see a lot of federal government customers uh, ease down from DC area. So. Yes, uh, that's in fact true. We already have a number of uh, very large agency representation from some of the bigger federal um, federal wow. alphabet soup that's out there. Uh, there's already quite a number of them have already signed up for the show. So we're very excited to uh, attract that audience um, down to the event. And uh, yeah, it'll, it, it, it's shaping up to be, I think, our best show ever. Um, and, and rightfully so whenever you give us 20 something months to plan it, uh, <laughs> willingly or not, it's, uh, hopefully it will be the best one we've ever had. Well, Pete, thanks again for, uh, for coming on and talking to us about PFE. I know that we're excited. I'm sure that the viewers and listeners are excited and, uh, you know, it, it, I think this put everything back into perspective for folks, kind of uh, to, to take the break necessarily uh, to ensure everybody's health and safety, but certainly time to get the show on the road. And uh, that road, all roads really leave, lead to Richmond, Virginia at this point. Well, I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, it's been a great 
you know, opportunity for us to talk about what's coming up and, you know, hopefully generate some excitement out there with folks to come to the show. Um, as you two know, there's nothing quite like it out there. And uh, it's just a great opportunity for people to come together, look at all the great new gear, test drive the new gear um, and, and, and meet at night and meet new friends. Um, and that's one of my favorite parts is, uh, you know, we call our attendees our friends because we do get to know everybody really well over the years and over the few days that we come together. Um, it's always a terrific group of people. And uh, we just love we just love spending time with everybody. So. So for anybody interested in attending Police Fleet Expo, you can visit us at policefleetexpo.com. Um, there's complete details out there on how to attend, um, dates, times, locations, and all the information that you would need. Um, you can also visit us on Facebook at Police Fleet Manager Mag and on Instagram at Police Fleet MGR. And thanks again, guys, for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. See you in Richmond. Yeah, great, great time. Thank you very much.